If you're getting ready to do your holiday shopping at Nike, Macy's, or Samsung, make sure you head to Rakuten first. Rakuten helps you save big on whatever you're buying for the holidays. Getting gifts for friends and family? Get some cash back for yourself. Plus, save on festive home decor, party outfits, and that trip to see your fam. With Rakuten, you can earn cash back on top of the biggest sales of the season, so you get the most savings. And it's easy to use. Just start your shopping at Rakuten.com or use the Rakuten app. You'll get your cash back payments through PayPal or check. Rakuten partners with over 3,700 stores. The stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers, and Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back. Join for free at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Your help is needed to locate Luca Magnata. This individual is extremely dangerous. He is a psychopath. He produces torture and murder videos to sell on the internet. We believe he is in Canada or Russia. Luca Magnata has also sexually assaulted animals and sold photos of his crimes. If you see him, contact authorities immediately. Do not approach Luca Magnata. He is a dangerous psychopath. Do not approach Luca Magnata. For more information, please join our Facebook group. Please pay attention to his appearance. Look closely at these photos. Luca Magnata is a bisexual porno star and model. He may also be in the United States, Los Angeles or New York. He has killed many animals in horrible ways. Join our Facebook page and help find this psychopath. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, much like Don King, this guy's got a crazy hairdo. He is the captain. Touch me and I'll sue. Go ahead, punk. Touch me and I'll sue. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening and thanks for telling a friend. Tonight we are drinking Cherry Spadina Monkey by the good people at India Ale House in beautiful Toronto, Canada, garage grade, four out of five bottle caps. Do you want to touch my monkey? Cherry Spadina Monkey is a sour ale. It doesn't taste like a monkey at all, so don't be afraid. It's, of course, fruity, sweet, and tart. I'd say it's a mild cherry flavor and a medium sour level. We are chilling in the garage today and having a good time because of our good friends. First up, a big thank you to Gary and Gail from Berea, Kentucky. We met them at CrimeCon. They dropped off a little present to us, so thank Mm -hmm. you. It was nice meeting the both of you. And it was nice drinking the moonshine. Next up in Parts Unknown, we have Sarah. We also have Meredith, who says, y'all rock. Y'all. Y'all rock. And also, in Parts Unknown, we have Leslie. And a big shout out to Peter in Salt Lake City, Utah. And last but not least, we say hi and thank you to Carissa in Hamden, Connecticut. So, thank you to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week. And if you want to buy us around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And if you'd like to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter untapped any of that stuff you could do so at true crime garage also while you're at truecrimegarage.com check out the blog i've been hanging out there a lot lately captain we do a blog for just about every case that we've covered there's a lot of really interesting conversations going on there all right let's get to part two of puka not hada all right everybody do your hair put on your makeup grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime Luca 
Luca Magnata was born in 1982. His birth name was Eric Newman. His parents were very young when he was born, and they divorced, and he goes to live with his grandparents. But they divorce as well. Luca is diagnosed with depression in his high school years, and he's prescribed medication. Now, in 2004 is when he first gets in trouble, right? We see Luca, he becomes friends with a 21-year-old girl online. Mm -hmm. And she has the reported mental capability of a 12-year-old. He would take advantage of their relationship, and he ended up taking some of her credit cards. And he used these to rack up about $10,000 worth of fraudulent charges. Mm -hmm. Now, there's also the thought that he sexually assaulted this woman and videotaped it. The sex charge is ultimately dropped. He only ends up being charged with the fraud charge. Uh, But at the time, he is warned that you have a medical problem and you always need to take medication for this medical problem. And if you don't, your life is going to get messed up. In his early 20s, we're going to see Luca start trying to become some kind of a star, some some sort of famous person. Yeah, he's obviously seeking fame and fortune, and we can see this by things he's trying out for. You know, we talked about he tried out for the show called Plastic Makes Perfect, a reality show. He gets rejected for that. Uh, he tries out for a show called Cover Guy. It's about finding the next male underwear model, mm-hmm. uh, and he is rejected for that. He does some work in the... Uh, porn industry. He did a couple of, of movies, I guess. Um, he also did some, some dancing and escort work. He was also featured in a story by naked news. I guess this is where they give you a news story, but they also strip down as well. Yeah. I believe on there, he did like some kind of interview where he talked about his work in the adult entertainment industry. Mm-hmm. And he didn't go by Luca Magnata in this interview. He went by one of his other aliases. Now, with Luca, we also see a developing fascination with serial killers. Um, And it's pretty extensive how how much he gets into this fascination Mm -hmm. to the point where we see he he claims. Well, it's it's really presented as that somebody else is claiming this, that he has some kind of relationship with the famous Carla Homolka, Mm -hmm. um, that they are dating one another, that they're in a romantic relationship for people that aren't familiar with her. Who is she? So Carla Homolka was married to a guy named Paul Bernardo. And one of the cases that they're famous for, they were kind of dubbed the Ken and Barbie killers, Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of people thought they were very young and attractive looking. Well, Carla, she was convicted of manslaughter. She participated in the rape and murder of three younger girls with her husband, Paul. Now, the thing is, though, she ended up kind of turning on Paul, claiming that she was being physically abused by him. Right. And a lot of the evidence they had against Paul came from Carla. The problem here, though, is... Paul gets sent away for a long time and Carla gets a slap on the wrist where they both should have been sent away for a very, very long time. Didn't they kill her sister or something? Yes. One of the victims was her sister. Now, the thing here is Carla, because many people considered her to be attractive and the the case was very strange and there's a sexual nature to the case, Mm -hmm. those two became kind of famous, you know, in a bad way. Right. Uh, the, in Canada. I mean, yeah. It's a very popular Canadian case. And then the thing here is, though, you have a situation where at some point Carla's going to get out. And so there was all this talk of once she got out, where is she? What is she up to? Much like we've seen in the United States with Casey Anthony. Where is she? Where is she hiding? Right. What's she up right. to? Is she in a relationship? Is she pregnant again? She's well, in a movie called Trolls. Well, <laughs> and... There was a lot of rumor that Carla Homolka was somewhere on an island somewhere. Maybe she was. I don't know. I didn't follow it that much. <laughs> the thing here is... The island of misfit murderers. Well, he he links himself. Luca links himself to this Carla Homolka saying right. that they have some kind of relationship together. And you can... He, he fabricates these pictures and puts together some kind of photo montage that would give you the impression that they're spending time together. Mm-hmm. Well, you know... Who said it best? Marilyn Manson, any publicity is good publicity. Uh, I don't know if he was the first one to say it, but yeah. Well, I think maybe he he, he changed it and said, 
bad publicity is good publicity. Right, right. Whatever. But Luca adapts this kind of theory, right? He adopts this theory and he comes forward and he says, you know what? My name and reputation has been ruined by linking me to this <laughs> Carla Homolka. Right. What reputation? Well, he, it's pretty obvious that he fabricated this whole thing and then he comes out to, to as a rebuttal. Well, later we would learn that remember those packages that were arriving with the return address of uh, having been sent by a person by the name of Rene Bordelais? Mm -hmm. Well, the thing here is that ends up being Carla Homolka's name later in life. So there Very again, weird. we yeah, yeah, there again, we see him tying himself to this person that he believes is a famous serial killer and famous for killing people. Something that he also did that I found very strange is he would write his own Wikipedia post. So it'd be like a post about Luca Magnata and all the things that he was doing. But since it wasn't legitimate, uh, Wikipedia would take him down. And I heard this happen multiple times, at least two, maybe three times. Now he would on his Facebook, he ends up posting a link to a video called three guys and one hammer. This mm -hmm. was a, a video that was unfortunately pretty well watched at the time. Um, it's a video of a man being beaten to death uh, by a group of teenagers. Well, then afterwards, the three guys in the video, they kind of became, it became a bit of an internet sensation. A lot of people watch this video. Right. Um, the thing here is ultimately these guys are captured and, and caught and tried and convicted for their, their crime. Right. Because it was a real murder. It wasn't a hoax. You right. Know? And that's, you know, there's some issues I have here with a lot of these like uh, crazy videos that people want to watch. Uh, you know, I get I get that there's some fascination by it, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know why people are watching these. No. And then here's here's a just a little bit of a warning. Today's you know, we cover this stuff and we know that we cover a lot of gruesome stuff week after week. But I feel compelled to put out of a bit of a warning here because today we're going to talk about something that we usually don't discuss on the show. Well, yeah, Nick ate a lot of beans last night, so he's putting out the warning that he's gassy, it's a little gassy. <laughs> no, that's that's not it at all. But what happens here, Captain, mm -hmm. is that because of the the hype and the everything surrounding this video, three guys and one hammer, uh, he Luca kind of locks onto this. And I think he sees something that he wants to be a part of. He sees something that he can he can throw out there. He can create something, throw it out there, and maybe gain some notoriety of his own. Mm -hmm. And th this is why I threw out the warning here, because he starts, well, he, someone, quote unquote, starts hyping a video called One Guy and Two Kittens. Um, and this video doesn't come out for, for a little bit of time. They're just hyping the video. Okay. So let's talk about this. Uh, one of the things that Luca does is he will create his profiles, but he also creates these fictitious profiles. So he basically has all these fictitious people that he's running their pages for commenting on this video is coming, right? Mm -hmm. This new video is coming. And, and so the, the hyping it to basically nobody. Right. So when we say hyping it, well, it's going out to nobody. And hoping that people come across these posts and come across the discussions, these fake discussions, and now all of a sudden they're excited or want to find out what this video is, maybe they start talking about it. Right. We'll see this time and time again with Luca basically playing both sides of the fence where he's setting up something and then he's also you know, forming a rebuttal mm -hmm. or, or creating hype for something he's going to put out himself later. Well... He does put out this video, a video called One Guy and Two Kittens. And in the video, what you can see... This is the warning. Yes. What you can see is a guy... I'll keep it short. A guy places two kittens in a bag and basically sucks the air out of the bag uh, with a vacuum cleaner. Mm -hmm. um, it's despicable stuff. And unfortunately, this video gets Luca, quote unquote, the fame he was looking for. Well, um, he doesn't get fame. He's getting attention, but to him, it's giving him fame. Yeah, it's giving him the notoriety. People were talking about him. People were talking about the video well, right. online. But they're not technically calling him Luca. Is what I'm the point I'm trying to make. Yes, they're talking about this video because in the video he is un unidentified. Right. Um. So this is an extremely unhealthy 
obsession of becoming famous to the point of hurting others or hurting creatures of any type. Right. Um, the thing here is this, this unhealthy obsession of his kind of creates and sparks a healthy obsession amongst others. A Facebook group is started uh, by a person named Ryan Boyle. Uh, he's a good man on a mission. Mm -hmm. He very, very quickly, thousands of people join his army and his crusade. They are going to hunt this man in the video. They're going to hunt the creator and the person that they see in the one man and two kittens video. And how they're going to hunt this person is going to do through, do so with technology and through uh, different computer and social media uh, avenues. Mm -hmm. They start looking for the man that they call the vacuum kitten killer or the serial cat killer. Mm -hmm. um, within about 24 hours, uh, the killer released two photos. Um, what we're going to see here is that we're going to see the person that they're hunting starts taunting the group that is hunting him. Right. Um, then someone planted a photo on a website. This is showing a man that is, he's on a bed, he's posing with kittens, with two kittens. Mm -hmm. These appear to be the same two kittens that were in the vacuum video, that were killed in the vacuum video. Mm -hmm. So then these, uh, you know, web detectives decide, hey, this guy is probably the same guy, right? Yeah. And then what they start doing is, is basically with metadata and all that stuff, they can start trying to figure out where the picture was taken, what time the picture was taken, and basically, through a bunch of their research, they start realizing a lot of these, uh, a lot of these items that are in the videos, as far as couches or chairs or whatever, match up with all these pictures that Luca has posted of himself in his apartment. Mm -hmm. And then after that, while they're looking, and they believe they're getting close to finding their guy, someone creates a post or an email. Mm -hmm. And it reads, the name of the kitten vacuumer you are looking for is Luca Magnata. He was born in Russia, lives in Los Angeles, and has lived in several different countries. The apartment in the video is located in West Hollywood. Hope this helps. I am 100% serious. And a lot of people suspected that this post was made by Luca himself. Yeah, and now armed with this information, with this name, these web sleuthers, these computer detectives, they're going to go and look and find everything that they can find on a person named Luca McNada. Now, they start pouring through all of the images they can find of him online. And like the captain said, they know that there's information inside those images. Right. Embedded it's metadata. In, yes. And what they end up doing is they find a photo that will give them a GPS stamp. Uh, this photo they learned was taken in Toronto, Canada in late October. Um, the images of him, of Luca with the kittens were taken in November. So they know that they're getting close to this guy. And these, these web detectives, they pass their information to the police. And now the police begin looking for Luca Magnata. Now the thing here is Luca had officially changed his name to Luca McNada in 2006. So mm -hmm. this is this is a real name. This isn't just a fake name he was going by. This was a real hey. name. Hey. <laughs> you want me to stay away from this subject? Hey. Um, this was a real name. Th I'm not changing my name legally to the captain. However, the, the police learn very quickly that they're not able to just go to their system, type in Luca McNaught, and have a whole bunch of information come up. This guy doesn't seem to have much of a paper trail. You right, know, they, he doesn't really exist on paper. Yeah, they can't find an address for him. They can't find, like we said, there's no paper trail for this guy. And re and just a reminder, I mean, like we talked about those, those the allegations of sexual assault and the fraud fraudulent charges those are under a different name right so mm -hmm. they won't even see him come up in the system on that mm -hmm. then about a year later in november december of 2011 there were more videos posted um in one of these videos you can see a man wearing like a santa claus hat and he he feeds he mm. feeds a kitten to a to a python a live yeah. kitten to a to a python. In the other video, a kitten is duct taped to a broom handle and drowned in a bathtub. 
Now, the FBI, you know, it's no, it, there's no secret here of mm-hmm. what people believe this kind of behavior will lead to. You know, when you have somebody that are, it, normal people can't do what he's doing in this, these videos. Right. You know, people that have a heart and have a soul don't do what he's doing in these videos. This often leads to people committing crimes against human beings mm-hmm. at, after these atrocities against animals. And we've seen this multiple times with different serial killers. On December 3rd, The Sun runs an article that is titled, Catch Psycho Who Fed Kitten to Python. Now, two days later, this this is weird, man. Again, we see him reacting to his own behavior, to his own actions. Two days later, we have Luca Magnato. He walks into the sun to the newspaper and he denies that it was him. He denies that it's him in the videos. He denies that he has anything to do with this. He's he's interviewed by um, a journalist there, Alex West. Now, about two days later, the sun received this email that read, it's fun watching people work so hard, gathering all of the evidence, then not being able to name or catch me. You see, I will always win. Mm-hmm. I always hold the trump card, and I will continue to make more movies. Next time you hear from me, it will be in a movie I am producing that will have some humans in it, not just pussies. Right, so what we have here is this individual, the sick individual, and at this point, too, that they know that there's some rumors that he's possibly connected to some serial killer or dated a serial killer, right? Mm -hmm. So we have evidence that he is harming these cats, He's not harming them. He's killing them. He's a complete uh, waste of breath, as as far as I'm concerned. Um, and now, this is you know ramping up the seriousness on as the, on a threat level. Mm-hmm. And it's after this threat, Captain, that he moves. Luca moves to Montreal, and after moving there, he starts promoting a video. He starts promoting his new video that he's going to call "One Lunatic and One Ice Pick." Mm-hmm. Now, but he also actually sends uh, a video or posts a video uh, somewhere where it's like a, it's the uh, intro montage to Catch Me If You Can. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about? That movie? Yeah. Frank yeah. Abinale. Not Abinale. Not Abigail. Abinale. Well, one of the things, Captain, to promote, let's say promote this new movie that he's going to put out called One Lunatic, One Ice Pick, is someone posted on a website stating Luca Magnata is an extremely dangerous and sick psychopath. He is incapable of feeling remorse. Psychopaths can appear very charming and look beautiful, but beware, they are cunning and highly maniacal. Attached to this were links to news stories about the cat killer. And then it was on May 25th that the video titled One Lunatic and One Ice Pick was published to the web right and so then we know what happens next right and so he's he's captured and now he has to be put on trial mcnada elected to be tried by judge and jury he pled not guilty uh admitting to the acts of which he was accused but claiming diminished responsibility due to mental disorders now right. some of the evidence that they saw at the trial itself was parts of that video were shown to the jury. And some of the evidence as well was six tools. These were the tools that we talked about yesterday uh, that were found, recovered just outside of Luca Magnata's apartment. These are items believed to have been part of the murder itself as well as the dismemberment of Jun Lin. And they include a pair of scissors, two knives, a screwdriver, and an oscillating saw and hammer. Um, These were never 100% directly linked to the murder, but they were found in close proximity to such. And as we said, they were able, unfortunately had to watch part of the video at the trial. Yeah. And they, and they found a psychiatrist that came forward, you know, after doing tests and after talking with, uh, Luca as much as he did, he came out to say, well, look, he shouldn't, he should be found uh, not guilty reason of uh, insanity. Yeah, his guilt was never a question. It was what is his responsibility? Is he criminally responsible for his acts? And that was Dr. Watts who came forward. 
he said he interviewed uh, Magnata 40 or 40 more to- 40 plus times. Yeah, and if you're interested in this, like, you know, psychology and, and stuff like that, this is a very interesting interview. You can find it on YouTube pretty easy if you just type in the doctor's name. One thing that he was learning, Dr. Watts was learning from Magnata was that Magnata believed that a witch named Debbie was constantly looking at him through uh, windows. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he also stated that for a good portion of his adult life and a lot of the evil things he did, things that were depicted in those videos, uh, he was being controlled by some kind of person within him or or directed by someone only he could see. Yeah, he was... (laughs) <laughs> being controlled by a lie. Yeah. You know, this is all bullshit. You know, like I, I do respect this doctor. I mean, I, I respect the interview that I saw on him and some of his theories on Luca Magnata, but all this is just a bunch of malarkey. This is a, this is a sick individual that gets off on getting attention because they never got attention when they were a kid. And yeah. all these stories about these witches and these demons telling them to do stuff. Uh, it's a bunch of horse shit. Well, I mean, he, we see from Ignata that he has no problem being an actor. He loves turning on that phone and recording himself and turning on the camera and, and acting in, in stories that he's creating, you mm-hmm. know? So he has some evil creativity. He has some acting ability. I I'm with you. I didn't get any bad vibes from that doctor, from Dr. Watts. I, I enjoyed his interview, but I, I'm with you. I think that this is a lot a lot of this is an act. I think he had some pre-diagnosed conditions that would help further believe that he was probably suffering from a lot of things at the time. Right. But he ultimately, he, he ran. He fled from, well, not, from the crime. Not only that, but he, you know, he tried to cover his tracks mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and stuff like that. That's, that's, that's the thing to me. It's like, you know, one, I think this was premeditated. You know, we t- we talk about him hyping the video, so it's all premeditated. Then he's trying to flee. He was trying to, you know, be smarter than the the cops and anybody looking for him. You know, he kills, you know, cats. You know, you piece of shit, you killed a cat, and then you're going to go online because you have zero friends, zero things going on in your life, and you're going to taunt people by killing cats. You know, you, you, you're the, you're one of the biggest pieces of shit we've ever had to cover. Well, and ultimately the trial doesn't last terribly long. I think it was like 12 weeks or something like that. But ultimately he is convicted of the murder of Jun Lin. Um, and you know, for a while they were looking into Luca for other possible crimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think they, they tried to tie him to one that w- took place in California um, but there was really, truly no link there. Yeah. And, I, and I, you know, I applaud this jury for looking at the evidence and saying, hey, look, based off all these these things, he's not, you know, criminally, you know, defined as being insane. Yes. And the thing here is, Captain, you know, I've had some people ask me, you know, because of this particular case, and we've seen other evidence of this as such on YouTube and Facebook and things like that, I've had some people ask me, you know, what are your thoughts on, on YouTube? What are your thoughts about these violent crimes getting put on the web for people to see? Are you, do you, are you upset that these outlets exist? So creating people, making people want to create these videos and put these things out. And the thing here is captain, in my humble opinion, Anytime I've heard about these or read about these stories, I believe I'm hearing and reading about people that would commit these horrible crimes anyway. Um, We might be in some way fortunate that they are dumb enough to put it on the web uh, because it ultimately leads to their capture. Well, what are your thoughts on Luca as just an individual? Um, I'm not going to lie to you. I do see somebody that I believe suffers from some illnesses. Yeah. He definitely has some mental illness. The one, the one that really where I called into question my own thoughts about Luca, there's a video of him where he's, I think he's like listening to Madonna and he looks like he's almost dressed himself up like Madonna. Like he's got the fake blonde hair and the Mm -hmm. very, he's put on a lot of powder on the face and the red lipstick. And he called a typical Friday night, bro. And he he uh, 
he's coming off like he's giving some kind of interview or if somebody's asking him to be on camera. Mm-hmm. And the thing that bothered me so much about it was he was believable to me. It, it, it had, I not known his personality, had I not had more evidence about who this guy was, I think I would have believed somebody else was in the room with him recording him. And that caused me to question a lot of his, his mental state. However, like you said, like I said, this is somebody that, that fled from a crime he knew was wrong. You know, you can't be criminally insane if you do something and you know it's wrong and you flee the area. Yeah, and the more I dove into this individual, I mean, there's parts of him that I feel bad for. Yuan, there was talk about being abused when he was a child and being beat a lot. Mm -hmm. Also, just, uh, you know, being kind of picked on in school, but also maybe not even paid attention to where nobody even, like he was the invisible kid or something. Mm -hmm. So there's parts of that I feel bad for. And then maybe that was the reason why he was trying to be famous. It didn't seem like he was going after having a skill. I mean, it's one thing if you want to be like a bodybuilder or a mu- musician or actor or something. It doesn't, didn't seem like he wanted to do anything. He didn't right. want to get good at anything. Like when he talks about, well, I go to the gym. Hey, I go to the gym all the time. Uh, you didn't lift. You didn't lift one single weight. You know, maybe you lifted some Cheerios in the morning. But, uh, so, it, you know, all that stuff is very difficult for me because uh, I feel bad on those levels. Uh, and I also feel like, you know, maybe because of the mental illness, it made his fascination of wanting to be famous for almost no reason, um, like get way out of control. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something when when they when they look into this individual more and when you'll you'll see books eventually about him and movies about him. I think they need to really dive into that because I think that was a lot more fuel uh, on that fire. Fascinating stuff. Let's take a beer break, Captain, because when we get back, we have a very special guest joining us in the garage. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, hel dot slash garage. If you're getting ready to do your holiday shopping at Nike, Macy's, or Samsung, make sure you head to Rakuten first. Rakuten helps you save big on whatever you're buying for the holidays. Getting gifts for friends and family? Get some cash back for yourself. Plus, save on festive home decor, party outfits, and that trip to see your fam. With Rakuten, you can earn cash back on top of the biggest sales of the season, so you get the most savings. And it's easy to use. Just start your shopping at Rakuten.com or use the Rakuten app. You'll get your cash back payments through PayPal or check. Rakuten partners with over 3,700 stores. The stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers. And Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back. Join for free at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Hey, I'm Travis Kelsey, and I'm here to tell you that you can get every touchdown from every game on Sunday afternoons with NFL Red Zone from NFL Network, included in Sports Pack on DirecTV, so you'll never miss a big moment. Hey, we kind of shared a big moment learning about all this great football on DirecTV, didn't we? I know I'll never forget it. Stop compromising. Get DirecTV with or without a satellite when you visit DirecTV.com. All right, we're back. Cheers, everybody. 
Cheers. And we have a very special guest with us in the garage here today, calling in from north of the border up in Canada. We have the host of the great show, True Murder, journalist and true crime author, Dan Zapansky. The godfather of true crime. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, a great pleasure. I'm a big fan of the show, so uh, I'm always interested in talk about true crime. Dan, when the story first broke about Luca Magnata, what was your initial reaction? Well, it's after working with Sidney Tierhuis and uh, the subject of Trophy Kill, what I realized is that we had a new legion of psycho killer where they didn't really have the time or the, the will to kill 40 or 50 people to get famous, so they had to create a, such a sensational crime and combine all the elements of all their serial killer heroes into one magnificent and shocking crime. And I thought that's what Luca Magnata had achieved. So, Dan, did you know that there was a suspect right away? Because when news was coming out down here, we were unaware that there was already a suspect and already a manhunt underway. Did you anticipate a lengthy investigation? I don't know if I... I, I can't remember exactly what I thought in t those terms, but quickly I gathered as much information as was reported, and they soon found the body of uh, Lin Jun, the 33-year-old computer science student. And so the manhunt was on, and they were looking for Luca Magnata, but in the stories, quickly, there came to be the story of the kitten killer, one boy, two kittens, and the hunt, the American and international hunt, for Luca Magnata, and they had named Luca, Luca Magnata. It was various characters, including the Barbie twins and uh, Panzarella from Rescue Inc. And these guys had identified Luca Magnata as the kitten killer, and they were already on his tail reporting him to the police. So that investigation helped identify Luca Magnata and understand the story of Luca Magnata. So when he was on the run, I knew he was a psychopathic killer, a very unique one. Uh, that obviously posted the murder set to music on a site, very much like somebody promoting a music video or movie. He had been online previously promoting this video that was to come and had actually spoken to a UK Sun reporter and had predicted that he would be in a movie involving humans and wouldn't be just pussies anymore. This is what quickly had come out from mainly from the investigation that was underway looking for this kitten killer, somebody who had asphyxiated a couple kittens on a video and posted it on YouTube. So very quickly, there was enough of the story that I could see what kind of character we had, and then quickly they were tracking him internationally through Interpol, and they quickly made an arrest. So it was a story that I quickly got immersed in and got a fair amount of information. And then when the trial came, there was more supplementary information. A very famous Canadian publication named Luca Magnata the Newsmaker of the Year. Now, of course, that's what he's trying to achieve with his actions. Does this solidify, does this validate his horrible and unspeakable actions? Well, I think that was McLean's magazine because that's our pretty well equivalent of, say, Time magazine. We don't have too many of those types of magazines. But... I think the notoriety that he wanted to achieve, I think they have a point there that it's in bad taste to call this person the newsmaker of the year. Uh, but yet at the same time, it, it conveys and supports the idea that Canadians are very, very uh, different than Americans about the issue of true crime and in particular cases that fascinate the public. We don't have our cases video uh, videotapes so are televised or any of the court cases televised so it's a completely different environment and with that comes a completely different attitude so if you think Americans would be shocked by this type of crime well Canadians are even more shocked and repulsed and really don't want to know the details you ask your average Canadian do you know who Luca Magnotti is they would say well yeah I heard of him but they would not be able to give you recall any of the details of the case and it wasn't of particular interest to them. There have been no books about Luca Magnata published whatsoever in Canada. And one of the big debates in this case was Luca Magnata insane at the time of the murders. 
Yeah, Luca's case often gets compared to the Greyhound bus killer case. In your opinion, Dan, was Luca's insanity, was it an act or was it real? Well, here's the thing. As I, as I chronicle in my episode, Psycho Killer Superstar, that there was plenty of evidence to support that he had a diagnosis of schizophrenia, paranoid schizophrenia. He had been hospitalized numerous times. His father was schizophrenic and recommended him to his own psychiatrist. Uh, so it's well documented that he did have, I don't know if you could say bipolar or schizophrenia a designation or a diagnosis, but definitely mental illness that can be was documented and proven. Yet at the same time, when you talk about the insanity defense and you brought up the Greyhound bus cannibal killer, where, where you talk of the definition of insanity, where a person would, well, that the Greyhound bus killer would fit that definition with uh, Luca Magnata trying to evade capture, doing all this promotional stuff for years, creating 70 Facebook accounts, creating rumors about himself dating Carla Hamalka, one half of the serial killer Bernardo and Hamalka. Everything he did to create a different or a an image of himself as more successful. So again, delusions of grandeur. And again, narcissism on display, the notoriety that he, he craved. And yet at the same time, he could be schizophrenic, he could be bipolar, he could be paranoid schizophrenic, and yet he could be a psychopathic killer. He could be both. And I think that's what we had here. And I think because usually there is some traction in court, not just with the Greyhound bus killer, but other cases that I've reported on where the insanity defense is now a pretty good defense, whether your client is insane or not, because we have a different definition than the American courts on that insanity. But I think the public was so revulsed by this person not only killing this human being just to be famous and just for the experience and just for the notoriety, and then sending body parts to the Canadian government officials, which they received, and to an elementary school, which was luckily intercepted, that this person didn't get much traction in court whatsoever with the insanity defense. And I think, from my experience, that Luca Magnana did not want to be known as a somebody to feel sorry for uh, a sick killer. He wanted to be known as a person that was a psychopathic killer that posted his disgusting video of necrophilia and cannibalism and dismemberment set to music, he wanted to be an original, a unique, more shocking, more sensational, and utilizing social media like no one else had used and utilized before. So the answer is that I think he was proven to be mentally insane, have serious issues like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, and yet, you look at this crime, per definition of insanity, he doesn't fit the bill, and he also fits the bill as a totally psychopathic killer. So not only is your guys' definition of you know criminally insane different than ours, but the sentencing is different as well. How would have Luca's punishment been different from what he received had he been found not criminally responsible? Well, in his case, he was convicted of uh, first-degree murder with a minimum of 25 years before parole eligibility. The insanity designation means that, for example, the Greyhound bus cannibal killer has no criminal record whatsoever. It's not murder, not even a criminal conviction. He's released without a criminal record and changes his identity and is free to go. So now we just have another case of a person was not criminally responsible. He killed a police officer with a snowplow, and he has been released after six years, which is the same amount of time as the Greyhound bus cannibal killer, six years. So you can see there's a huge difference uh, in the amount of time that you may be able to serve 
So you you can see that also that the small, very very minuscule percentage of insanity, of successful insanity defenses in the U.S. pales in comparison to the defenses that have been used recently, especially, and the advances in the insanity defense in Canada make it, I think, that predictably a lawyer would be doing the best thing for his client. So I think they are sometimes when it looks like it, when people say that crime seems to be insane, I think then they can at least attempt for their clients an insanity defense, which will mean that their client can be out in as little as six years. And who knows, with precedent-setting cases in this country, if that six years for, for the most extreme killer like the Greyhound bus killer, you can imagine that maybe people with just one murder, one not-so-sensationalistic murder may be released even in less time. Well, it's insane to think that Luca Magnata would have been out just in six years for this horrendous crime if he would have been found criminally insane. Mm-hmm. Dan, from an outsider's perspective, it appears that Canada might be focusing on treatment and rehabilitation for violent offenders. Is this progress or is this a step back? I don't think it's progress when the psychiatrist for Vincent Lee, the Greyhound bus killer, said after five years before the release, or say four years, that Vincent Lee hadn't hallucinated in a year. And that he was confident that because he had responded so well to the medication, again, under a completely super controlled environment, and then he was released for fresh air walks and visits to the beach and gradually more and more restrictions were were lifted. But as far as I could see from all my experience being an older person and looking at this kind of stuff for years is that it looked like They were really interested in making Vincent Lee a sort of a poster boy for psychiatric rehabilitation, which means drugs. It means antipsychotic medication. And then people will say, well, how do you know they're going to take the medication? And I say, well, how do you know the medication works? How can... And they set the risk, the psychiatrist, to me, it's laughable that he would set the risk factor at 2% saying, well, listen, there's only about 2 or 3% chance of, of reoffending. Yeah, that's malarkey. And another case where they just let out the guy said they killed the police officer after six years, they have two nurses, doctors, uh, health officials go and, and give him his medication twice a day on the weekdays and once a day on the weekends. So if that's the kind of precautions you have to do to make sure that this person that you've already deemed as harmless in society remains harmless, then it really is a tether that really is only conditional on whether whether those drugs always work and always work so well and very little monitoring by any psychiatrist. And again, this is what we're faced with in terms of the fear in, in the U.S. that a person responsible for some of these type crimes would someday possibly be exiting the hospital to possibly reoffend. We don't have that. We have the possibility that they, it's not a possibility, they will be released, it looks like. There'll be no reason not to release these people, regardless of the offense, and in short order. And the tether is, the guarantee is the efficacy of those anti, uh, th- that antipsychotic medication. We've seen recently that Luca Magnata was scheduled to be married. Uh, there's some things coming out in letters where he's stating that he gets to watch movies. He gets movie channels. He can watch any title that he wants. Mm-hmm. He's been on dating websites. Uh, where is the punishment? Is this too many freedoms when does Luca start to feel like he is being punished, that he is a person living in a cage? He didn't provide any of these privileges to his victim. It doesn't seem like he's being denied a lot of privileges now. Well, yeah, it kind of seems like the parents sent the kid to the room for the punishment. 
but by the way, there's a big screen TV, internet access, and all this stuff. What kind of punishment is that? It feels and it sounds like he's at summer camp. He's just not allowed to leave. Well, I wish I could tell you that he wouldn't be eligible for conjugal visits, but I think he made me eligible for conjugal visits. It's a... I understand and I believe in rehabilitation, but I don't believe like very many people and the experts agree with with me, I would think, well, they do, in that there are certain crimes and certain criminals that cannot be rehabilitated, as simple as that. And so rehabilitation in general for people in incarceration, in prisons, absolutely a, a bright idea and a proven good idea. But it's not a proven good idea to think you can rehabilitate people simply with the amount of time. And as we found out, too, just because someone is of good behavior in prison, they could certainly reoffend. And you're seeing things in Canada that I've spoken about on my program about murder turning into manslaughter with diminished responsibility, say, with alcohol, that if a person were, were drunk then that murder charge now turns into a manslaughter. And that manslaughter, even though you could get life sentence, the precedent setting typical sentence is 10 years or less. And we've seen in Canada things that would be regarded in the U.S. easily as murder, regarded as manslaughter. And that person in a prison situation is doing two or three or four years and then released again, and now we just see in the little small place that I'm right now, the same situation where another person that was charged previously for murder is released and is charged again. Dan, you wrote a book called Trophy Kill, and in that book you cover the case of Sidney Terhus. There are a lot of obvious similarities between that case you covered and the Luca Magnata case. Can you tell us about your experience and about the book Trophy Kill? Trophy Kill featured Sidney Tierhues, and when he saw an opportunity to become famous for killing, he took a victim and dismembered him almost surgically and then cut him into eight pieces and castrated him and did a bunch of mutilations and then reassembled him crudely. Again, obviously not literally, but for display and for shock value. And because the victim had stolen Susan Sarandon's gold necklace from the movie Shall We Dance, the gold necklace was found at the crime scene, which sent the story around the world because of the celebrity connection. Now, Nobody wanted, especially the movie business, didn't want any connection to their movie, Shall We Dance, with this. And so they said the the jewelry had nothing to do with the motive for the killing. But the jewelry had everything to do with the motive for the killing because that killer, Sidney Tierhus, thought he could get famous by butchering a human being, being in such a sensationalistic manner. But he didn't stop there. He went and contacted journalists. And some of them were very, very shy about getting involved in this case in the case in particular, and I wasn't. And so I became involved, and he revealed all kinds of things about the the necrophilia, his utter enjoyment of the defiling and the dismemberment, and everything involved with this experience of killing. And these are the kinds of stories that would appear in the Canadian media. Uh, Sidney Tierhus seemed to be competing with his heroes, as he told me, his heroes, Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, Dennis Nielsen, John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy. He'd been influenced. These were his role models, his serial killer role models. He was influenced by all of the successful serial killers in the U.S. Because really, just like a musician or an author or a movie maker, there is no success in Canada unless you have American success. So we all dream in Canada of being successful in the U.S., in the arts. And when these people believe they're artists, they're filmmakers, very much like the filmmaker in Edmonton uh, that lured somebody into his, his garage to film and kill and then document what he had done because he was a filmmaker. And Sidney saw 
the dismembered body as his art creation. He, he described the body as a human trophy, hence the title Trophy Kill. And so Luca Magnata had seen the success of the filmmaker Mark Twitchell in Edmonton, and he made it to Dateline, two-hour special. And then Sidney Tierhuis made the front pages, and then all around the world, because it was a celebrity connection. And so by the time Luca Magnata came around, he was aware, as these guys all are aware, of the upcoming serial killers on the rise and the legends. And what the legends did and how they became the leaders, the most infamous. And he said, well, necrophilia, cannibalism, filming it so that it's for posterity, it's captured forever. Posting it on social media, on a gore site that has ten thousands of people visit every day. Then creating the hype and creating a whole interesting model porn star background for himself, reality star background for himself, created by himself. So that's what the connection was, is that Sidney tried to outdo everybody else and get famous with one and then intimate that he was and insinuate that he was a serial killer. And Luca Magnata didn't have the time like the Green River Killer to kill 49. So he just killed one in the most sensationalistic manner he could think of. So is there similarities? There's similarities in the same kind of mindset. And they are not alone, but it's a new legion of Killers that love the attention from social media like killers have done in the past, but these, in a different society, this is even more important, is the fame from the murder. It's, it's crazy to me because it seems like these psychopaths are doing anything they can to become famous, even if that's murder. Yeah, Dan, is this a new form of sickness? Is this a new illness? That, that the internet has brought to us, seeking fame and fortune through murder? I think it's a symptom of the madness that we live in, where uh, compulsion and obsession and distortion of fact, not distortion of fact, distortion of reality. If people are living lives that are unsatisfying, but yet can live online and live a different life, at least they think that's the that that's the attempt. I think it's a symptom symptomatic of sort of a mad world. You have all kinds of people that really haven't achieved anything, and and yet they want to do something like this just for the notoriety, just to be famous at something. And I think it's an, a misunderstanding that everybody has the same kind of values. I think there are a lot of people through a lot of various reasons. Uh, they just are the opposite and of a lot of people and have different values and completely have been conditioned to think differently about the world. And they're angry and they don't achieve much and they think they're not a part of something. And I think when you have just enough people interested in the same deviant thing that you may be interested in, it gives that person comfort and thinking that they are finally in part of a community that understands them. So I, I think mental illness can be combined with the same psychopathic uh, tendencies that, and put those things together and things like drug abuse as well. You, you can have a combination of things factoring in to some of these crimes and some of these killers. I'm still kind of freaking out. <laughs> I figured after about 20 minutes or so, I'd calm down. But we were in the garage with Dan Zupanski, the godfather of true crime. Pretty wild. And Dan, we really appreciate your time here today. Is there anything regarding this case that stood out to you? Uh, any lasting impressions? Anything that we didn't get to? Like I talk about, and I think which is the most horrifying Twilight Zone-esque kind of aspect of it, is that the father of the victim, Lin Jun, traveled from China, um, really couldn't understand the language so much, but he came to attend the trial. And at the end, 
unbelievably, this unrepenting psycho killer, through his lawyer, agreed with Lin Jun's father that Lin Jun's father would want to speak with Luca Magnata because he had unanswered questions about the death of his son. And I could almost hear the music from Twilight Zone when I was reading that because that would be the most horrifying experience, I think, for him and the most gratifying experience for Luca Magnata. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Hey, thank you, Dan, for calling into the garage. It was a pleasure having you in the garage with us this evening. Yeah, thank you, Dan, and congratulations on your book, Trophy Kill, very well done, and the success of your podcast, True Murder. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a big fan of True Crime Garage. Thank you very much, Nick. Have a great day. Wow, I think we made it. I think we made it. We had the Godfather calling into the garage to talk with little old Captain and little old Nick. Yeah, I think we got a new new friend of the show in Dan Zapansky. Well, that's because he didn't meet us in person. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very Wayne's World moment, you know, like when they met uh, Alice Cooper. Mm-hmm. And they're going, we're not worthy. We're scum. We're slime. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Zapansky just put out his hand and kissed the rings, right? Mm-hmm. So the recommended reading this week is? Of course, pick up Dan Zupanski's book, Trophy Kill, The Shall We Dance Murder. And you heard him talk about it in his own words. If Regarding the Luca Magnata case, there's so many similarities here. You mm-hmm. almost feel like he was somewhat inspired by the killer that is featured in the book, Trophy Kill. And you can pick that up by going to our website, truecrimegarage.com. And click on the recommended page. We have all of our other books recommended there as well. And you can purchase any of those through our Amazon banner. And whatever you purchase through the Amazon banner, they give us a little kickback. I mean, maybe you got to get some garden hoses. You know, maybe you need a shovel. I, I don't know what you need. But if you buy it through Amazon, they charge you no extra and they give us a little kickback, a little love. Also, if you haven't listened to the podcast True Murder This is one of the first podcasts that uh, me and Nick used to listen to uh, and kind of have conversations about. You know, Mm -hmm. we'd listen to an interview with some author, and next thing you know, we're in the garage for two, three hours discussing the interview uh, that Dan Zupanski gave on his podcast, True Murder. So if you haven't checked that out, you should do so. And and if uh, True Murder ever needs a new producer, would be happy to produce the show, right? Sounds fantastic. All right. Hope you enjoyed the two-parter on Puka Not Hada. Thank you to Talkspace. Thank you to Dan Zupanski. More importantly, thank you to all of you out there, the True Crime Garage Army, for joining us this week. We'll be mm-hmm. right back with you next week here in the garage. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't let If you're getting ready to do your holiday shopping at Nike, Macy's, or Samsung, make sure you head to Rakuten first. Rakuten helps you save big on whatever you're buying for the holidays. Getting gifts for friends and family? Get some cash back for yourself. Plus, save on festive home decor, party outfits, and that trip to see your fam. With Rakuten, you can earn cash back on top of the biggest sales of the season, so you get the most savings. And it's easy to use. Just start your shopping at Rakuten.com or use the Rakuten app. You'll get your cash back payments through PayPal or check. Rakuten partners with over 3,700 stores. The stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers. And Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back. Join for free at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N.